inviting me to your platform. It's actually going to be the first time where I am talking about my book publicly. And uh, so you guys are like my guinea pigs. I get to test it out to see what lands and what doesn't. Um, you know, I called my book Made in South Africa because it's about my own personal experience of being South African, you know, against our collective and national experiences of the things that we go through, the very dramatic things that we have experienced over the last sort of nine years specifically. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's called Made in South Africa because I think people like to, out of convenience to have a conditional relationship with our country. And I say this because a couple of years ago when President Zuma fired, you know, the Minister of Finance or whoever it was, and, you know, it was um, headline news, you know, the days when we woke up in the morning to find out that the cabinet has been reshuffled. And um, this um, white person who was in my life at the time said to me, you are young enough to immigrate. And that caught me by surprise because I've never thought about immigrating. If I have, it wasn't for those reasons that I'm trying to escape from a, a sinking ship. You know, my response to her was like, if the ship is sinking, I am going down with it, right? And I almost felt a protectiveness over the country as she was saying that. And, um, you know, everything that I think is great about me, I realized that it has been made by South Africa and everything that is bad about me has been made by South Africa. Everything that is good about Jacob Zuma, you know, is, is made by South Africa and everything that is bad about him, we need to take ownership of that. So I think you know, the book does speak to the theme of Creative Mornings, which is spectrum. Because you will see in the book that I have journeyed across two extremes. And I don't know here by show of hands who was born in the 1980s. I think that we, <laughs> you know, we were born, you know, we were part of a generation where Oliver Tambo said, this is going to be the last decade of apartheid. And it actually ended up being the case, you know, and we know what it is to transition from, you know, the, um, the tail end of apartheid and seeing a country in transition, you know, and seeing the symbols of transition. So uh, watching the US election has been interesting because a lot of people will say, this is not American. You know, this person is not American. This is not American sort of uh, values. And this is not who we are. And my response to that is it is who you are. It is part of your heritage. Um, just like being in South Africa, you can't cherry pick the things you like and don't like about it. You know, you, you can't look away when um, you don't like something, you have to confront it. And part of the book is about me confronting, you know, across the spectrum, the things that have made me and the South Africa that has made me. Um, so the spectrum of, you know, good and bad, the highs of winning the Rugby World Cup to the lows of the PPE corruption, you know, all of those things are part of what makes this country what it is. And if you can't accept that, if you can't accept that spectrum of being South African, then you have a conditional relationship with this country. And I'm not sure how useful a conditional relationship with South Africa is when we are faced with the challenges that we are faced with, which need commitment which need an unconditional commitment to correcting those and course correcting the country. So, um, as I said, I was born in the 1980s and um, I was born in Johannesburg. It's very important to claim that I was born in Johannesburg because I've realized that when you are black and living in Johannesburg, a lot of people ask you where home is because they can't fathom that you were born here 
they think that she migrated from somewhere else to here. So I was born in Johannesburg. And 18 months after I was born, my, my parents decided that I needed to go to Port Elizabeth to live with my grandparents because there was greater support there. You know, uh, my grandparents, my aunts, my extended family is in Port Elizabeth. And Johannesburg at the time was just in so much turmoil. The country was in turmoil. I mean, in the 1980s, we had about five states of emergency, right? And my parents being um, young, a young couple and trying to find their feet, they have this newborn, they're trying to, you know, um, start their careers and they're living in Soweto and a lot is going on. They decided that I would be better off in the stability of an extended family. And Port Elizabeth is very important to my story because I had a very foundational racial experience in Port Elizabeth before I could even understand what that moment was. And um, I have a very vivid memory. I can, I can even you know, go back to that day. It has stuck with me. I think I was about three years old, three or four, and my aunt was taking me to town. You know, it was a treat. I'm gonna go to town, run some errands, and then go back to the township. And I remember that she was holding my hand because as you know, you know, town is very busy and uh, being a three-year-old, she didn't want to lose me in the crowd and that kind of thing. But briefly, her and I were separated. You know, I, I let go of her hand and then I remember being panicked a little bit because I couldn't see where she was and there was the hustle and bustle of everyone um, rushing past me. And in order to anchor myself, I just reached up to try and, and, and grab the closest hand I could find. And the closest hand I could find was that of a white woman. And before this, I used to think that white people were people who just lived in television sets. You know, I had never up close seen one. Television was where I saw white people, the texture of their hair, their noses, their skin. They were on another spectrum completely on the on the other extreme to what I look like and who I was. So they were a curiosity. And here I am in town, briefly disorientated. And in order to anchor myself, I hold on to this woman. And I look up and the hand that I have grabbed is a white hand. She looks down at me. She snatches her hand away. And she had a look on her face as if I had violated her, right? And I remember my aunt coming, you know, rushing over and picking me up and saying, you don't touch Abelungu, meaning you don't touch white people. And I've never forgotten that moment. I'm sure my aunt has, but you know, she was an enforcer at the time of the segregation of the country. She was telling me and policing my behavior at three years old and giving me life advice that you don't touch white people. And I remember thinking that right, the lines have been drawn. I am never going to touch a white person. I'm never gonna to look to a white person for fellowship. Actually, I'm never ever going to look at a white person. So, you know, um, that became a foundational experience for me. And I actually regret not putting it in the book, but it's a memory that has always stuck with me because you go from that moment to the country's transition you go from hyper segregation and this hyper awareness of keeping your own space and, and not intruding on somebody else's space. And then now the country is transitioning from apartheid to a constitutional democracy. And I then um, moved back to Johannesburg to live with my parents. And I start going to white schools and I have white teachers, you know, and, uh, it was quite surreal because, you know, I was trying to see what is going to make Miss Fletcher, my white teacher, like me. I approached with caution because I had been scarred before. And I was very pleased to see her accept me with so much care. And I started looking at her behavior you know, what does she respond to with the other kids in the class so that I can amplify that. So this was the decision that I am going to assimilate. 
keep in mind, you know, going to my first school with white teachers, it's the first time that I ever heard my name being said by white people. And it didn't sound like my name, but I wasn't going to correct that, you know, because damn it, we were going to integrate and I wasn't going to make things difficult. And, um, you know, if a misplaced vowel in the middle of the L and the W, you know, I could live with it if that is the price that we have to pay for integration. So I'm going to read uh, from my book where I talk about how I tried to assimilate until the price was just a bit too much to bear. And um, this talks about an experience that I had in primary school. So this is page 177 of my book. We live in a post-conflict society founded on and defined by racial and gender oppression. In my adult life, I have resolved to resist any form of domination and subjugation, almost with paranoia because of witnessing how unkind the world is especially to black women. I have become assertive and protective of my identity out of fear of being run over. I saw a quote online the other day and it plays in my mind in a loop. It says, primarily, I need identity, as much of it as I can amass for my need for identity is mutually articulated with my terror of annihilation. In my younger years, I was not so consumed by race. My parents desired to create a better life for me unburdened by history. But despite their efforts, the seeds of my obsession with identity were planted at the age of 13. I was in grade seven and it was valediction night. At the time we lived in Dipkloof Soweto, so I couldn't go home before valediction because my suburban school was by apartheid's deliberate design too far from my school. So I went to my white classmate's home, which was by design close by. My classmate's mother had prepared an amazing pre-valediction dinner. Valediction means goodbye or to part ways. And because of what happened at dinner that night, my white friend and I would not just be parting ways because we were going to different high schools but we would be parting ways because of my experience at her family's dinner table. My friend's mom had prepared my favorite, pasta. Everyone at the table picked up their forks and knives and I was about to pick up mine when my friend's mother politely told me, it's okay, Luando, you can eat with your hands. She was smiling politely and reassuringly, indicating that this was a space where I could be black. What black meant to her was me eating pasta with my hands. Did she assume I did not know how to use a fork and knife? In her efforts to be culturally sensitive and inclusive, she left me feeling excluded and othered. Two things a 13 year old does not want to be. It dawned on me that she knew nothing about me. Even though I had been to her home a number of times, she had never been to mine. She didn't know anything about my family or how we lived. Her attempt at inclusion was bound to fail because it was predicated on assumptions of black people without any effort or maybe even the interest in doing the work of learning in the same way that black people have had to observe, learn, participate and assimilate into white culture. So I read that to say that, you know, when we talk about spectrum, it's a range. And I think that I developed a kind of range through assimilation and that I had to traverse these different worlds between Deep Kloof Soweto and Imarensha where my, my school was. And I look at my white friend and her family as being, you know, not having that spectrum and how that sort of also shortchanged them and put them in the position to be able to make that remark of you can eat pasta with your hands, you know, and not understanding what that moment meant because they did not understand me. So that is a sort of another moment of awakening for me. And, um, you know, I continued to grapple with a sense of belonging because I felt like I was in this bubble 
and it snapped, it popped. And I was experiencing difficulties, not just, you know, being a black kid in white schools, but also experiencing difficulties in my black neighborhood because I was that kid who was going to white schools. So the other part that I want to read is the, the rejection from some of my black friends in, in the township because I was going to white schools. I was a coconut who had to be gutted of all the white that was inside. One day when I was about 12 years old, I was walking home from the taxi stop with my tennis racket in hand. I went to a multiracial school in a leafy Johannesburg suburb. I played tennis. I listened to NSYNC. I preferred staying indoors and reading rather than playing outside. And I wore glasses. All this annoyed my bully to no, an to no end. He called me names incessantly to a point where my mom wanted to get involved, but I told her I could handle him and that it did not bother me. On this particular day, his taunting was particularly annoying. He loudly called me coconut in front of all the other neighborhood, neighborhood kids who were playing outside. I was just trying to walk home. He started following me, continuing with his provocations I turned around and I started beating him with my tennis racket repeatedly until he was crouched over in a fetal position on the tarred street. I ran home and, the clo and closed the door behind me. What had I done? Why was I so angry? Why did I lose control? I immediately called my mom at work to tell her that what I had done before the boy's parents told her first. I fessed up, expecting to hear my mom's disappointment but she was not disappointed. She was proud of me for standing up for myself. She, she said she had seen how this boy had been bullying me and she knew that it was only a matter of time before I snapped. I was so grateful that my mom did not make me feel bad for fighting back. The term coconut conjures up such bad memories of being bullied and uh, being bullied for, for experiences that others identified as white tendencies. The questioning of my blackness offended me and also saddened me because it seemed that the grounds for acceptance were narrow and based on stereotypes of what black is. I am grateful for every black person who's authentically themselves and who adds to an expensive definition of blackness. There is room for all of us as long as we do no harm. So, you know, I read those two excerpts from my book just to give you a sense of the grappling between these worlds and these issues that come with trying to find uh, belonging. I continued to grapple with what my relationship with other races would be. I wondered if belonging was possible outside of my own tribe. Our constitution proclaims that we are united in our diversity. So even when I left school, and started working, it was clear to me that we were united only to the extent that we were willing to assimilate to a culture that was foreign to us. This was until I came across the blueprint for belonging, and that is the Constitutional Court. So I clocked at the Constitutional Court in 2011, and to give you context, prior to that, I had worked in mainly corporate spaces with distinct, you know, Western cultures. You know, the spaces that I had worked in, you know, you could close your eyes and someone could airdrop you in any of those office spaces. You could open your eyes and you would, nothing would tell you that you were in South Africa about those spaces. And I would say that, you know, um, next time you walk, whenever that is into a corporate space, just ask yourself what it is about this building that says that I am in South Africa. Our spaces are pretty much a copy and, space and paste of uh, buildings that you could find in New York, you know, uh, you could find in Europe somewhere. And when I walked into the Constitutional Court as my working space, it was so transformative. And um, I just want to share something I wrote about the court uh, that will give you a sense as to why. It is unusual for a court to be built on the site of a prison. Yet the Constitutional Court's judges deliberately chose the Old Fort Prison as the permanent home of the court. 
I am not proud of the history of the site, but I'm proud of what we have done with it. The court could easily have been built in Santon, but instead it is in downtown Joburg within reach of those who need its protection the most. One of my duties at, at the court was taking visitors on a guided tour of the court and Constitution Hill, something I still do today, even though I no longer work there. The court was deliberately designed to leave its visitors optimistic about the future and more importantly, in awe of South Africans, what we have overcome and our resilience. It stands as a monument to our achievement as a people. Conducting these tours and seeing visitors from Africa, North America, Europe, and Asia soak in our incredible story and for the duration of the tour, forget all about the negative narrative of today's prophesizing our doom keeps me optimistic and would make it impossible for anyone to leave. Sorry, and it would make it for it would make it impossible for anyone else to ever write off this beautiful country. One of my favorite parts of the tour is informing the court's visitors that the chamber of the court was built with the bricks from the demolished awaiting trial section of the prison. These bricks have intentionally been left bare to remind us of our past as we embark on our constitutional transformation. The design of the court is proof that it is not interested in whitewashing the past. In fact, it resists that and its judgments always acknowledge where we come from. The aesthetic of the court is distinctly African and the symbolism used throughout the building communicates the message that this is a court conscious of its setting, its history and is optimistic about the future. There is an eight meter tall wooden front door to welcome visitors with engravings in South African languages, including sign language and braille to ensure that no one feels excluded on, or intimidated as they walk in. Nguni cattle hides decorate the bench, each with its own distinct pattern symbolic of the diversity of South Africa and of the bench itself. The ground level ribbon of light in the court's chamber and the, abundant, and the abundance of glass used throughout the court ensure that the judges are not shielded from the reality of the outside world and also serve as a reminder of the merits of transparency which is a break from our secretive past. The court uses a tree as its official symbol. This is evocative of the African tradition of resolving disputes under the shade of a tree, which promotes transparency as the whole village can observe the proceedings. The judges themselves are clad in green robes rather than the traditional black in an effort to rebuild the once broken trust between the justice system and the society by saying that this court is new and different from what you experienced before. You know, other than what the building looked like, um, the people at the court really run the spectrum of South Africans. You know, I clerked for Justice Edwin Cameron, uh, who is, as I'm sure you guys know, is a white man who is HIV positive and gay. And I, I firmly believe that his story would not be possible in any other country except for ours. We will probably go our lifetimes without seeing a person who is gay sit on the US Supreme Court. And I'm just saying that because of uh, the confirmation hearings that are happening and me watching those confirmation hearings and thinking, this is so backward. You know, um, the constitutionalism in the US is really troubling for a number of reasons. And here at home, I think that we really miss the opportunity that is presented by the constitution that we have. And clocking at the court really exposed me to ordinary men and women who were using the constitution to not change just their lives, but the lives of others in similar situations to them. And clocking for Justice Edwin Cameron was seeing was building a relationship with a white person that was based on authentic curiosity on both sides. There were no assumptions. He was getting to know me. He was interested in my parents. He was interested in our traditions. And similarly, I was interested in his life. And uh, because of that, he remains a mentor today. So I really saw another way of being and of working at the court, you know, keep in mind this is a court that also had a judge who was differently abled. This is a court where 
the chamber knock next to ours was that of Justice Ngabinde, who was a princess, you know, she's royalty in, in her other life. And she brought those traditions into uh, the constitutional court. There's so much I could say about the diversity and the different perspectives and the lived experiences that people brought to the court. And the court doesn't encourage that you suppress that. It actually encourages that we express that because it's for the benefit of the work that we are doing. So in conclusion, I just wanna say that um, I'm attempting to traverse a spectrum as my country attempts to move from one spectrum to the other and to move closer to the values and the promises that are articulated in the constitution. We've gone from apartheid to democracy, from exclusion to inclusion, from darkness to light. I've gone from my own insecurities to confidence, from alienation to acceptance. And one of the things the interim constitution says is that the constitution will be a bridge from our history to our future. The court is built where it's built because it wants to be a bridge between different South Africans, whereas apartheid was you know, building walls in between people. So using the theme of spectrum, what I try to be and what I hope this book will be is a bridge you know, that connects all of us. And I think that if we reached out outside of ourselves to other people and become bridges, I think this country would be better for it. So thank you so much. To, to start the questions off, I'd love to know from you, um, you know, you use conversations in your work a lot. Um, yeah. and, and, and I'd like just because I've got sort of inside information from the conversations you've had, like why, why do you think conversations are important and, and what role do you think they have in the spectrum that, that we are in in the country? Because there's different people at different stages, you know, and, and at all these different things. And I suppose one of the, the biggest challenges we face is how do we how do we accept where we all are and how do we move to a, you know to a better a better place i think it's a highly um i think it's a highly personal journey you have to hold a certain vision for south africa you have to paint some kind of horizon of the kind of country that you want to live in and you have to ask if whether the the way that you show up in your life brings this country closer to that vision. And I think if it doesn't, you know, there's a lot of work that you need to do. And I think that one of the things I have learned through the dialogues that I host with people sitting around the table from different backgrounds is that you, you do need a curiosity. You know, you, you need to want to get to know your fellow citizens you need to come out of your comfort zone and have conversations with people you normally wouldn't have conversations with and go to places that you normally wouldn't go to. And I think that you need to cultivate a deep feeling in your heart. You know, um, I think a lot of us live in our minds. Everything is so intellectual, cognitive and all of that, that we've really forgotten what it is to feel, not just for ourselves, but for other people. And I think once you have the ability to feel and once you've articulated the vision for the country and you can stay connected to that vision, I think the rest of it becomes instinctual as to what will take you towards that vision. And I think that is a journey you don't have to take alone. You know, you can find people who are motivated by the same values and the kind of vision that you are. And despite the worst of times, even now, you know, during uh, COVID, I see a lot of people and they inspire me who are really rolling up their sleeves and doing the work, you know, um, and they are not overcome by all the challenges and they still believe in that kind of vision. And I think our generation, those of us born in the 1980s, you came of age within that euphoria of the Mandela years and that feels good. That felt good, you know, for the country to be so joyous and to be so um, connected and to be fighting for a common vision. It's like, 
that is always up for the taking. You know, we can always recreate that, not just with the World Cup and all of that stuff, but just every day, if you set the intention, you can always see what is best. And when you see what is worst of us, you can always be inspired by what is best to correct that. I love that. Uh, I love that idea of, of setting intention and, and striving for it. Cause I think it is people, people are going to try and they're not going to, they're going to have good days and bad days. And I think it's, it's that idea of just dust yourself off at every morning and set that intention and, and try again. Um, I, I love that we can move back to that, that feeling of the, the Mandela years. I've got a, a question from uh, Nomonde who says, um, you know, I'm intrigued by the inclusion of the emails Justice Cameron would send to you, particularly about the articles you would write. Could you Wait, expand what? on the- Sorry, this means this person has a copy of my book. Yes. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, um, it just came out. So I'm like, you're the first person that I know that has it, that has actually got into the part of emails between Justice Cameron and I. Yeah. <laughs> So she would like to know, could you expand on your decision to include these emails, to include these in the book? Um... Um, you know, he wrote the foreword to my book and the reason why I chose him, I, I could have chosen a number of people, but he's a mentor of mine and it's, it's so authentic. Like even when I'm not looking, he's looking at me and what I'm doing, you know, um, I could write an article and somehow he finds it on the day that it's published and he sends me an email and he'll say, I like that. I like this about it. Good work, you know, or you'll see after, after um, one of my articles came out, he actually rebuked me and I included that one as well because I used a word he didn't like. And I like that. So for me, I know him as someone who's always engaged in my life and what I write. And I wanted to give people an insight of that mentor-mentee relationship, of that kind of encouragement that I get from him. And um, I just, it's also a testament to the impact he's had on my life because I don't know if you guys have ever read any of his books or any of his judgments. He's literally probably in my top five of favorite writers. Even when he sends me like, you know, a WhatsApp message, I'm like, oh, this is so good. Like he's put these words together so well. So because he's my favorite writer, it just, um, it felt good to, you know, um, include him in the book in that special way because he's always got my back and um, it's a relationship that I wanted people to have insights, uh, some kind of insight, because I think it shows that it's possible for a black woman to have this white man as her mentor and have it be such a productive and inspiring relationship that has fueled my passion to want to contribute more to South Africa. So it's kind of nice seeing um, the comments that he had to make uh, to everything that I've written. So that's why I included it. It's just an ongoing conversation that we have and i thought i should share that as part of my first book because it's so much part of the inspiration for it and on the downside you may say that getting validation from a white man who's so in, who's so esteemed is something that unfortunately is still in the back of my mind oh cameron approves of that even though i don't ask for it he just sends it to me but a part of me has become used to getting the feedback and it has a lot of weight but um, it has a lot of weight because I know him as a person. So it's beyond just his uh, racial identity. You know, it's just someone I respect. Thank you for that. Do, do you think, uh, do you think uh, kind of these, this mentor-mentee relationship, do you think this is important in South Africa? And do you think people should be seeking to mentor other people and, and, and be, med, be a mentee to people? You know, a, a part of me, I connected to ancestry in the sense that I have I have great relationships with people who are older than me, people who've seen a lot, people who've experienced so much. I would be a fool not to take advantage of that. So as a lawyer, it's a no-brainer. This is one of the best legal minds there is in the world 
And obviously I want that to rub off on me. I always joke with him that, you know, when you die, please leave me your brain. <laughs> and um, so my approach, and I hope you get the sense of that in the book, that I have a huge amount of respect for people who are older than me. And living through COVID-19 has allowed me to lean on them because they've seen worse, they've survived worse. They've got so many tools in the toolkit and I wanna take advantage of that. An old mind is a gold mine, a gold mine. And I wanna pick their brain. I wanna know how they survive certain things. And that's just how I feel about my ancestors, not necessarily people who've passed on, but people who will become sort of part of my ancestry. From a mentor mentee, it's the same, whether it's on a professional level, a personal level, you need someone in your life who's been over the hill, you know, and they've come back down and be like, mm, this is what I have to tell you about what I've seen standing at the top there. You may want to experience it for yourself, but I could also spare you the trouble, which can be so useful. <laughs> and it can save you a lot of trouble, but also it can be there to catch you when you fall, you know? So, uh, I completely have, with the mentors that I have, most of them are older than me and they've lived through a lot. And it has been um, just, it has eased my troubles in the sense of sometimes we think getting older means that um, you have to pack it up. And you see some of my mentors who are in their 60s, 70s and 80s and you're like, this person is just getting started. So you just see that there's still a lot of do and a lot to contribute and a lot to, to see and do. And by the way, Nomonda, thank you for buying my book. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> if I ever see someone buying my book, I'm just gonna like hug them. <laughs> but thank you, that means so much to me. That's amazing. Um, Bridget didn't really ask a question, but I think it can be turned into one. Um, it's that the United States has shown us a lack of empathy and individualism and how that's defined their country. Um, do you think that's playing out here or, or you know, do you think we have a different path to, to walk? So one of the things you, you'll, you'll know about me after reading the book is that I studied in the Midwest in the US at the University of Notre Dame. And if you also know me, you'll know that my favorite TV show ever is The West Wing. And if you know your West Wing trivia, you'll know that the president on The West Wing, Jet Bartlett, went to Notre Dame. So for me, this was fate, you know. <laughs> and I arrived on campus hoping to see Martin Sheen because I was told he hangs out there quite a lot. And I learned so much. You know, if you want to talk about spectrum, going to the University of Notre Dame in the Midwest in an election year. I mean, I went from hanging out with the liberals to the conservatives, but one thing it did for me is it really made me understand. I may not agree with it. I understand the conservative agenda, the reasonable, the, the, um, the moderate conservative agenda. You know, you can go through law school in South Africa without even touching the topic of abortion. And you go to the US and it is the issue. And in the US, it does not appear explicitly in the constitution whether women can make those decisions about their bodies. And then you read section 12 of our constitution which was trying to avoid us being caught up in these kind of debates that Americans have every single time by making it clear, you know, that these are your entitlements. And then in the US, the stakes are high for Supreme Court judges because they get to say what the constitution means where the constitution is not explicit. So the culture there was completely different, not just the legal culture, but also just the, the, the community culture that I experienced there. And I did get the sense of it's a very individualistic culture. And, you know, I would try and share the South African experience that we've got socioeconomic rights. They don't want to hear that because socioeconomic rights means that 
the government has the right to provide the basics for people. And socioeconomic rights are infused by the notion of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu means I am because we are. You can never separate yourself from the collective. And that's been our tradition and our culture here. And it's not to say that I'm gonna paint the US with one paintbrush because I pretty much found my community in the US that very much hold similar views to, to us. And I think that just like we have the notion of Ubuntu here, there are people who are very individualistic in their outlook, but I think we do emphasize it and we do emphasize it in the way that we draft our laws and in our politics more than you know, um, it is in the US because it's not really part of you know, that culture, especially not part of the, the legal culture. I know the constitution like ours starts with we the people and a sense of the collective, but I don't think it translates because that we the people basically meant us white men of 17, whatever it was that the constitution was adopted. And ours meant the people of, you know, what we looked like in 96. And I think we were always deliberately trying to grow the sense of who the people are. I don't know if I've answered your question, but I think it is damaging and I've seen it here at home as well when we have an individualistic outlook, not only in our politics, but just in our culture. That's, that's amazing, Lando. I wanna end just with uh, one announcement and then I've got a last question for you before we wrap up the session. So, so just thank you so much for, for your time and your passion. Um, I just want to just tell everyone that that Fresh Earth Food Store has um, felt your pain of not being able to, um, you know, have your own breakfast um, sponsored by Creative Morning. So seven people are going to get a voucher for a coffee and a muffin, so you can go and recreate the the breakfast experience. So so the team's going to reach out to you and and hit you up with that. So so my last question for you, Luando, is, and it was one I asked you on the podcast too, is. If somebody's interested in this in the constitution and you seem to have a deep understanding of it like like where do you start like where do you like what is your your kind of call to action for south africans who haven't necessarily engaged with this amazing document that we have you know i would say start with the preamble to the constitution you know we the people of south africa recognize the injustices of our past and um understand why the preamble says what it says. It looks back and it looks at the present and it looks forward. For me, that is what has painted the horizon for me, that we shall all be equal under the law, you know, that everyone will live in a country where they can fulfill, you know, their potential and that we will belong to the family of nations. And um, I think once you accept the preamble's vision, then you come into the pact. And that pact is represented by the preamble because it's in our name, whether you've read it or not, it says we the people and you're part of that. So I think it's also understanding the blood, sweat and tears that inform that preamble. That preamble has genesis, you know, in the Freedom Charter, which was in concluded in the fifties you know, concluded at a high point of oppression, you know, just a couple of years into the apartheid regime where people are dreaming of these freedoms that are articulated so clearly in chapter two of our constitution and having a reverence for that, that for every single person throughout the decades who's held up a placard and who has marched and prayed and said, we want one person, one vote, that we want healthcare, we want housing, we want education, we want human dignity, we want freedom, we want equality. That every person who did that has written the constitution. They wrote it, you know? And the fact that those entitlements ended up in this document is astounding to me because you couldn't even say that you want those things. Saying those things was a crime. And that's why those people in Cliptown who wrote the Freedom Charter were arrested for treason. And to now live in a country where 
you know that you have those entitlements. They may not be realized, but they give you a different posture when you know that you have them. And it gives you an opportunity. So I would say that read the preamble, understand the history of our constitution. It didn't just start in the 90s. You can trace it to colonial times before apartheid. I honestly believe that if you truly dive into South African history, there's no way you write off our country. There's just no way you can do that with a clear conscience. When you understand that it's been fought for by people who could have chosen to look the other way or to accept the status quo or to leave the country. So I think when you understand what has been given for us to be able to exist the way that we do, you develop an emotional relationship with the constitution and you de develop a deeply feeling relationship with your country and a sense of awe, even in the despair, because this is not the first time this country has seen despair, but despite the five states of emergency in the 80s, despite young people as 12 years old being shot at by the police in the 70s, despite over 60 people being murdered by, by the police in Charleville, you know, they were like, this is worth it. Our freedom is always worth it. So the constitution doesn't represent that we now have freedom. It's just an opportunity for freedom. We're still in a struggle for freedom today. You know, we're still part of a liberation movement if you choose to be. So I think you see the constitution as an opportunity of how we can expand uh, um, our sense of freedom.